right now in Hebrews 6, verse 4, and it says very starkly and, and shockingly in verse 4, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. And Heavenly Father, as we open the Scripture and read a little further, I pray that you'll show us, teach us how we can understand this, how we can live as a result of this. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. If we fall away, are we beyond hope? If there's someone who we've loved who was truly born again, a follower of Christ, and now they're not following Christ, is there any hope? And, and what does falling away actually mean? I think of Julian, and he's really a story I want to be thinking about this morning. And the first time I went to church as a believer, I've been saved for three days, I went in Julian's mum's car, and of course Julian was there, Al the punk rocker that I've told you about, he was in the car as well. We were in a Citroen 2CV, 1968. That was not a very cool car. It's a bit like um, a, Volks, a Volkswagen Beetle was like the next step up. I mean, the Citroen was like, it was a really rubbish car. It was two doors, and uh, it didn't go, it was always breaking down. But so, so it wasn't very cool at all to be in that car. But Julian was there, and he helped me. Uh, he encouraged me in the faith. In fact, when my dad died a month later, he gave me some brilliant bereavement counseling. He just said to me, oh, sorry about your dad. I said, oh, thanks. And that was about it. But at least Julian was the one that he, t he tried to talk to me about. It. That was pretty forward in those days, you know, to, to talk about those things. But um, Julian was a strong believer, so it has appeared, a great guitarist, John, you'd have loved to have him play in your band. And uh, we played in our, in our Christian, that's probably my phone. Uh, we, we played in a, in a Christian punk band called the Neutrons. We had a great name, at least, and, and we, were, we were loud. We had a lead singer by the name of Emu. Isn't that a great name to be called Emu? He couldn't even sing, but you know what, in a punk band, that doesn't matter at all. But, uh, but anyway, Julian, we, when I was 15, he was 16, he, he would, um, I'd have Al the punk rocker playing the drums, I'd write songs, I'd be like John Waller, and I didn't know you then, John, of course, and because uh, John was not even born, probably. And then, and then Julian was this great guitarist, and we told so many people about Jesus. Uh, he, we prayed together a lot. We went to conferences together. And then after about a year, I noticed that Julian just sort of didn't seem to be showing up as much. His attitude seems to change. He would get petty about things and jealous about stuff. Uh, he seemed to be doubting the word and drifting from the body of Christ. And he became just like that coal that fell out of the fire and very quickly seemed to go out when he was no longer connected to the fire of the fellowship. And if he was in the parable of the sower, I don't know if he was like the seed that never took root or whether he was like the seed that sprung up fast and then was burned away or whether he was like the seed that was choked by thorns but certainly Julian stopped bearing fruit. Holiness began to stop. And then there were girls and the drugs and some more drugs. And we'd try and pray for him and visit him, express our love to him. I remember one day I went back to visit him. And, and this is a, a, a thing for us as, as students, as young people. We've got to know who we can have fellowship with. Uh, I remember visiting in, in his flat one day. And he, he said, I'm going to light up a joint. Is that okay? I said, no, that's not okay for me. So you do what you like, but I, I'm out of here. And so he said, um, okay, okay, okay. And, and so off I went, and I tried to say, we love you, but I'm leaving right now. And I was walking down the street towards home. And he came running after me. He said, it's okay, Reese, 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 Reese. Everything's good. And, uh, but in his back pocket, he had this great big joint that he gets out. And I had to say to him, look, I can't even walk along the street with you like that. I'm just running. And sometimes you've got to state your intention. I love you, brother, but I just literally had to run away from him. Obviously, he was, he was defying the angel armies of the Lord. He was trying to tempt me and get me involved as well. Let me fast forward 10 years from then. Julian was clearly walking away from the Lord. We returned to, to Tynmouth. 
Uh, I became the pastor of the church there. And we had a great ministry going uh, outside. We would do open air services. We'd get 400, 500, I remember one day 600 people. We'd preach the gospel. People would get saved. About 10 years later, there suddenly I could see Julian. And he was causing a commotion. He was making a lot of noise. And I saw that he, he'd got a cross. And I, there was no sort of a racist symbol in the UK on this one, but he, he just started burning the cross. He started mocking the name of Jesus Christ. So there was the brother, and he was the guitarist in the band, and we would, we would sing in our school assemblies. We'd tell people about Jesus, and now here he is 10 years later, mocking the name of Christ. What do we make of Julian? Well, I see two things here. I see here in chapter 6, verse 4, that Julian may well have been those who truly was enlightened, filled with the Spirit, washed in the blood, following Jesus Christ, and now he slipped away. And because Christ is only his, his only hope, if he rejects Christ and he even mocks the name of Jesus Christ, then there is no salvation, there is no hope. If you reject Jesus Christ, there is no hope. Uh, to, to fall away clearly means to reject the things of God. So one possibility is that Julian was following Christ. Now he has rejected Christ, and it's impossible for him to be brought back. Another possibility is that Julian never truly knew Jesus Christ, and that he was involved in the things of the faith. He was involved in prayer meetings. He was involved in the youth group. He's involved in worship. He's involved in ministry, but he never actually truly was dead to self and alive only to God. And frankly, I don't know the answer to that. And I hope I'll remember to remind you a few more things about Julian a little bit later. We're talking about falling away. Israel fell away. And the Lord said to Israel in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, the Lord said through the prophet Hosea, these people are no longer my people. They've broken the old covenant, and so my word to them is they are now not my people. Well, what was the only hope for Israel? The hope was that Messiah would come, that there would be a, one who came from God who was also one of them, who would die for them, and he would bring a new covenant where the law of God would be put on their hearts and their minds. And I thank God that Jesus came to that fallen away nation, Israel, and he is the hope not only for Israel, but for the nations. We thank God for the new covenant. But I wanna say this, friends, and I think that's what Hebrews 6.6 6 is saying. If we who are in the new covenant reject Jesus Christ, God is not gonna send another Christ to us because we already have one. And so if you and I reject Jesus Christ, what hope is there for us? Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And we want to talk this morning about what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Is it possible to be truly saved and to fall away? Is it possible for our own nation to come back to God? I'm not sure we were ever were really with God, but is it possible for us truly to be one nation under God? James 1.21 reminds us of the moral filth that is prevalent. The New Testament church the, the prevalent culture was of moral filth. We live now in a culture where there's so much moral filth and we wonder, God, is there any hope? Can I just tell you the hope of the world is Jesus Christ. The hope of America is Jesus Christ. And your hope and my hope is Jesus. <clears throat> is it possible to be truly saved? and to fall away. Yes, we're gonna be a little scholarly about this this morning, but I think we're also gonna be passionate as we open God's word. And the first question I've got then is, is it possible to be truly saved and to fall away? Well, what does it mean to be saved? How can I be saved? What does that mean? Well, there's part of my story that is quite unique. Christ worked in my life in a particularly unique way. But there's also part of my story that is the same as every other Christian story, that's in Christ alone that I'm saved. God uses many ways to get our attention and draw us to him, but there's only one way. He worked differently in your life, but at some stage, there had to be conviction of sin, acknowledgement that we're a sinner, and we need a savior and faith in Jesus Christ. So God is working in each one of our lives in many ways, but there's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. And so for Peter and James and John, Jesus goes to their situation. He walks down by the shore, and what does Jesus say to them? Follow me, follow me, 
Jesus says. And then Matthew is at the tax booth. Nicodemus, the religious leader, came at night where Jesus went to visit a woman who felt far from God in Samaria. The woman by the well, he visited her by day and said, here's living water. Zacchaeus was up a tree and salvation for him was to op open his home to Jesus and to change the way he ordered his financial life. That was how salvation worked in his life and his faith in Christ. A woman caught in adultery was told, neither do I condemn you, now sin no more. A thief on the cross who was justly being condemned for his thieving was also a blasphemer, blasphemed Christ. Six hours later, he goes, Jesus, remember me. And, re and Jesus says, what? Today you will be with me in paradise. Can you see how God worked in all those different situations uniquely? But it's the same work. It's the work of Jesus Christ. The only way we can be saved is through Jesus. Now that ain't politically correct. That's an unpopular thing to say because universalism says there are many ways. Pluralism says everything is true and it doesn't really matter anyway. Christianity says Jesus Christ is the way and in fact America needs Jesus. How can I be saved? John 14, 6, Jesus said, say it with me everyone, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I'm saved by knowing Jesus Christ. The next chapter, John 15 says, I'm a branch in the vine. I'm vitally connected to Christ. He's in me and I'm in him. We can't separate ourselves. To be a follower of Christ is to be organically, intimately linked to Christ himself. I want us to turn to Acts chapter 2. We're doing a tour of the Bible. We're headed in, once we get to Acts 2, we're going to head in one direction. Okay, I'm not dotting everywhere. We're just moving forward. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Rustle those pages. Tap those pages iPhones, and find our way to the scripture right now, shall we? The Holy Spirit has come on the day of Pentecost. God is moving in power, amen? Hey, I need some passion today, amen? amen. And then in verse 38, empowered by the Holy Spirit, there were only 120 of them, but empowered by the Holy Spirit, Peter stands before Jerusalem and says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Pluralism says, some of you. Christianity says, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how someone is led to Christ, by receiving the gift of the Spirit. The promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off. Verse 40, with many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And how many were baptized, friends, that day? 3,000 were added to their number that day. The first thing I want to say is that Christ alone can save. How are we saved? Christ alone can save. I want us to turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 22, everyone. Romans 3. Everyone say Romans. Chapter 3, verse 22. Rustle those pages again. Find your way there. Romans 3. And what I want to really emphasize, it, it's not about we, what we do. We do need to respond, but salvation is something that God alone can do. We can't save ourselves, amen? Although even though when, though when Peter says save yourselves, he means find a way to be saved, and the only way is who? Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 22 of Romans 3, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Look at verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Do you believe that the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ, brother and sister? Amen. Well, secondly, therefore, we must believe and receive this. We must put our trust completely in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, verse 10. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. But friends, I want to warn us, this is not an insurance policy. This is not like a, a little thing that we have to do in order to sneak into heaven. I want us to see now that to believe and receive Jesus Christ 
is a total transformation and a resurrection that changes my life completely. Something that I'm so excited about that I'll spill onto the streets of a city and say, Jesus is the way, even if it gets me thrown in jail. And, that's what, and those disciples, they rejected materialism. They lived lives of generosity. They went out boldly and witnessed. They lived lives of sexual purity. Every part of their lives was transformed. They became missionaries because they believed a, a radical transformation had taken place in their life. Being saved is a radical thing. It's totally transformational. Galatians 2.20, that's the next one. A couple more Bible books. Galatians, so 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Galatians 2.20. Do I, have I got my little ticket to heaven? Have I got my little ticket to heaven? Paul didn't see it that way. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. I'm totally sold out for Jesus. He was crucified and so I've been crucified. He's been raised and I've been raised as well. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. To be a Christian is to live with Jesus. It's not something that happened to you in the past. It's about trusting Christ today. You may say, Pastor Reese, I was baptized. I'm not interested in that. I'm asking, are you trusting in Jesus Christ today? I was taught in Sunday school as a child. I'm asking, are you living for Jesus Christ today? Amen. Amen. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, everyone. Flip over the page. Stop applauding. Overwhelmed. Ephesians 2, verse 1 just reminds us, Christ alone can save. It's, it's totally what he can do, but we've got to believe. But believing is not just like, yeah, a little bit of faith. It's about a total lifestyle. First one, as for you, you were dead. You were the walking dead. You were dead. And verse two and three says, and there was nothing you could do about it. You were lost. Everything you did was totally for you and to feed your walking dead, zombie-like deadness. But what changed, verse four, but because of his great love for us, God who's rich in mercy, and I want to pause and say, God who's rich in mercy did not say, never mind about sin. You can carry on sinning. I'm not that bothered about sin. God remained profoundly offended by our deadness and our unworthiness and our unholiness. But God did say, I want to forgive you and transform you and change you. Look at verse 5. He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead. It's by grace you've been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That doesn't sound like getting a ticket to heaven to me. That sounds like a, such a transformed life that it's almost as if we're living it in heaven. Amen? How are we saved? Christ alone can save. We must believe and receive, but I want to say this. A saved soul serves and grows. If you've been saved, then there's going to be a spiritual growth that follows that. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says it beautifully. Turn there. Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to what? Do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. The salvation that he gives us has enduring power. If you have been saved, if you have been born again, that he's given you enduring power to grow and to live and to proclaim his name and to be bold and witness and to be generous and to be sexually pure, pure in an impure culture. He gives us power to endure, amen? I, I want to encourage you today that if you are in Christ, He's given you the strength to endure, and he will give you that strength as well. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can stand up to, but he's going to provide a way out. Amen? Colossians chapter 1. Everyone say Colossians. Don't worry. I'm not doing every Bible book. We're going to finish on time. It's okay. All right? But I'm praying that the Spirit will come down in this message. Amen? Colossians 1.29. To this end, Paul says, isn't this? To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. The Christian has powerful energy working in us so that we don't fall away, so that we continue with him. But I tell you what, we nonetheless must strenuously contend with all that we've got. 
The, there are two Greek words that I love here. One is called energe, which is like energy. The other one is dunamis. What does that sound like, everyone? Dunamis. Dynamite. God kind of gives us a spiritual dynamite, a spiritual energy. And so if we're saved, I want to use my own paraphrase, if we're saved, we will put our back into it. If we fall away, we're not contending strenuously with all that energy, even though God offers us us offers persevering power, the one that falls away does not have persevering power, is not contending strenuously for the faith. And it makes me answer, ask the question, if God gives persevering power to the believer, has the one that falls away ever truly known Jesus? Increasingly, I find myself thinking, I'm not sure Julian ever really knew Jesus Christ in the New Testament way of a resurrection, being crucified, dead to self, alive only to God. Can I ask right now, are you a New Testament Christian? Have you truly been saved? If being saved is to be born again in Christ alone, believing, receiving, given this enduring power and energy, have you truly been born again? Are you a little bit like that balloon that we occasionally talk about? And it's like your pastor or your Sunday school leader has to keep hitting you up and hitting you up, and you, and you, you stay in the air for a few seconds, you come down gently, and you have to be encouraged and encouraged and reminded and reminded. Or are you like that helium balloon? You got the Spirit of God, and though you go up and down with the wind in one sense, you're strong and you're filled with His Spirit. Can I just say, New Hope? We're supposed to be the helium balloon, we're supposed to be strong, we're supposed to be lifting our community up and drawing the lost souls, not so they rely on us, but so they also have the same spirit and can rely on Jesus Christ. Brother and sister, if you find that your Sunday school leader is always calling you up and saying, where have you been? Where have you been? We love you. We care for you. We're praying for you. We haven't seen you in six weeks. Can I just ask, are you a New Testament Christian? Do you just need to surrender your life to Christ and hear Jesus say, follow me? Do you need to hear the Apostle Paul saying, I've been crucified with Christ. I'm nailed to a cross. Oh, oh, I can't be in church. This, oh, the hawks are playing. Oh, the falcons are playing. Oh, the braves are playing. Oh, such a beautiful day. Can't worship with God's people. You can't expect me to tithe. I can, I can barely make it through the month. It's like, are you a New Testament Christian friend? I, I can't tell my friends about Jesus. They'll be offended. And I see our brothers and sisters in the Far East or other in the Middle East right now declaring Jesus is Lord and then getting their heads chopped off. That's what New Testament Christianity can look like. Not that that's the only outcome. That's just for the martyrs. It's a special place in heaven for the martyrs, according to the word of God. But I'm asking you are, you, are you a New Testament Christian? Have you truly been saved? I wonder whether there are many people that fall away that simply have never truly been saved, never truly been born again. We have nearly 7,000 wonderful members, wonderful people. We, we love them, but I tell you what, a few have gone missing. And some appear to be dead to God. And some are carnal. And some go up and down. And some live for self. And some are not sold out for Jesus Christ. We need to be a regenerate church. We need to make sure that we don't fall away, but that we, we are of those who will strenuously contend to the faith because we've been made alive and we've been given persevering power. We need regenerate Sunday school family groups where we're born again and filled with this spirit and going out on mission. R.T. Kendall, in his wonderful book, Once Saved, Always Saved, says, we don't do Bible study to be saved, but to understand what happened to us when we were saved. Let me ask, are you saved? Are you truly saved? Secondly, what is it to fall away? We can see that in the next verses, Hebrews 6, verse 7. Everyone say Hebrews 6, verse 7. We're going to see a contrast between the fruitful Christian and the unfruitful. Verse 7, land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces, listen, thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Jesus said exactly the same thing in John 15. If you do not remain in me, because a follower of Jesus remains in Christ, amen. 
If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 1 John 3, 9 says, no one, who is born, no one who is born of God will continue to sin. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. We, we will sin, but we don't continue to sin and keep falling to those same snares all the time. If we're born again, if we find ourselves in a perpetual state of sinfulness, the Holy Spirit will convict us, we'll get right with God, and we'll start following Christ in a fresh way. Amen? There was an old poster that I remember seeing uh, a while ago, and it said this, if you were accused of being a Christian, it's a question, if you were accused of being a Christian, it should be on the slide, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were accused of being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? Have I fallen away? Um, Is there real evidence of Christ in my life, in your life? There it is right now. If there were... You're accused of being Christian. Is there enough evidence to convict you? Can I ask right now, are you a New Testament Christian? Have you fallen away? If you've fallen away, the word of God is very serious. It says there's no way back. There's no way back because if you're rejecting Christ, you're rejecting the way back. I plead with you, whatever state you're in right now, get right with God. Come before the Lord and be a New Testament Christian. Live completely for Him. Are you repenting of your sin? Are you trusting in Christ? Are you calling on the name of the Lord? The last question I want to ask is, can I come back from where I am? Can I come back? If, you've, uh, if you know that you're saved and you've been getting weaker and weaker, you're not as passionate as you used to be for God, you're not as consistent as you used to be for Him, is there a way back to being sold out for Jesus Christ? I want you to ask, I want to ask right now, was there a time where you could honestly say, I have been at some stage in my life just totally thrilled with the things of God and sold out for Him. Put your hands in the air if you've ever been there. You just know you've had times in your life, you've just been completely sold out for Him. Hands down. I'm not going to ask you if you're still there, if you're still in that sold out place. But if you have been in that joyous, thrilled, sold out for God state before, is there a way back to that? Is there a way back? Well, I, I want to mention what I think is one of the great myths. And that is, I can always be saved any time. I can always repent any time. I don't see that in Scripture. Now, God, if I do repent, God is gracious, isn't he? If I confess my sins, he will forgive me. But I I think that's a bit of a myth because it seems to me that the moments when we are moved to repentance and those moments when we are seeking him can sometimes be very rare. And my warning to us today is that if we think, well, you know what, I, I'm, gonna, I'm still thinking about this. I'm, I'm still pretty happy being a halfway Christian. You know, because there are so many people who are not sold out, sold out for God. I'm pretty, pretty happy being a halfway Christian. And uh, I think I'll just continue to calculate whether I really want to be completely sold out for Jesus. Because, like, if I'm generous, I'll lose out, right? And if, if, I'm, if I'm bold in my faith, I'll lose out, right? I wonder whether we calculate in my mind, do I really want to be sold out for Christ? I think that's a really dangerous place to be, don't you? To be sort of calculating whether I really want to be sold out for Jesus. Because I tell you what, there may come, come a time when you'll never even ask that question again. You get so used to that living in the fast lane, the broad way, that that narrow road to life is just so far from you that you'll never be on that place again. The Bible is always saying now is the day of salvation. And that's why Peter pleaded with them Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. It seems to me that those moments of saying, all to Jesus, I surrender, can sometimes be very, very rare. If this is one of these moments today that God's people are saying, Lord, could I give my whole life to you? Could I be sold out for you? If that's what God is doing in your heart, then I say, don't resist that thought. That is a good thought. That comes from heaven itself, but it's from hell itself. The rich young ruler who thought he was so cool, he would fit in Fayette County so well. We'd probably vote him on the town council. He was such a fine, young, upstanding man. He checked all the boxes. Everyone was impressed with him. He had really good social skills. (laughs) He was very popular. He knew how to work the crowd. And the only thing, he was as lost as a goose. 
and he didn't know it. In fact, even when he was with Jesus, the rich young ruler's thinking, he knew Jesus was special, but he's like, I can hang out with Jesus. But this young, rich young ruler thought he could save himself. He didn't realize how lost he was. A thief on the cross goes, remember me, Jesus? The rich young ruler, though, filled with himself, Jesus said, all you've got to do is sell everything you've got, give it all away to the poor, and you'll be saved. Because you'll be basically dumping all the stuff that matters most to you, and you'll be grabbing hold of treasure in heaven. How did the rich young ruler go away, everyone? How did he leave? Sad. He left sad. And yet there were those who were, whose lives had been pitiful compared to the rich young ruler who grabbed hold of eternal life when it came their way. And I just want to warn us that the Bible says, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day for repentance. Repent, believe, receive the promise of Jesus Christ. Don't put it off. Don't settle for second best. Don't settle for half-hearted Christian living because I tell you what, the most dangerous thing to be in the kingdom of God is lukewarm. What does the word of God say? God's gonna spit out the lukewarmness. I encourage you to be sold out for Jesus Christ. In closing, I wanna suggest that saved souls persevere. Saved souls persevere. If you have been born again, if you've been resurrected, if you've been made alive, then you're going to live. If the baby's been born, then that baby, we trust, is going to live. And it, it, its natural development is towards health and living a long time. If you've been born again, you have eternal life. You're going to live forever, so start walking in that eternal life and don't even tempt yourself to fall away. I emailed some of the young leaders in our church to say I'm speaking on Hebrews 6, a controversial passage. And my son-in-law, Alex, replied to the guys and said this, most of the people I know who believe you can lose your salvation end up losing their salvation and leave the faith. People who believe that you can't lose your salvation end up continuing down a path of righteousness. Praise the Lord for a gift that is never taken away. And so I want to say today, blessed assurance, blessed assurance in the name of Jesus Christ. Find your insurance and your joy in Christ today. Don't fall away. Don't slip away. Contend strenuously for the faith. Give your all for Jesus Christ. Be a New Testament Christian. And I'm going to ask again, are you a New Testament Christian? Are you truly his? Are you saved? Well, if you are saved, you're going to persevere. If you are saved, you're going to demonstrate generosity and boldness and witness and purity in an impure culture. I'm going to ask us to stand right now and read a, a few closing verses from Hebrews 6. Would you stand? We'll have some music as well. But I'm just going to exhort you now not to slip away. I'm going to call you to the front as well in a moment to say, if there's someone like a Julian in your life who used to seem like they were following Christ and are now not, would you come forward and pray either for their salvation or come and pray that God will somehow graciously intervene before they're lost forever. I'm gonna ask you to come forward in a moment and pray for our nation, for America, for the Spirit of God to come and fall in our nation on this Pentecost Sunday, amen?